Reading to the Bible in one year, August 22nd, 1 Samuel 14, Romans chapter 12, Jeremiah 51, and Psalm 30. Now the day came that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come, let us cross over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah, under the, par- the pomegranate tree which is in Migron. And the people who were with him were about six hundred men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the priest of Yahweh at Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Now, between the passes by which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp crag on the one side and a sharp crag on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Senna. The one crag uh, rose on the opposite, uh, sorry, on the north opposite Michmash, but on, on the other side, Words are hard today. Starting back over, verse 5. The one crag rose on the north opposite Michmash, and the other uh, on the south opposite Geba. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come, let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps Yahweh will work for us. For Yahweh is not restrained by, uh, to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Turn yourself. And I am here with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men and reveal ourselves to them. If they say, Wait until we come down to you, then we will stay in, or stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then uh, we will go up. For Yahweh has given them into our hands, and this shall be a sign to us. So both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. So the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us. We want to make you know something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for Yahweh has given them into the hands of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer put some to death after him. And that first slaughter, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, was about twenty men within about half a furrow of an acre of land. And there was a trembling in the camp, and in the field, and among all the people, even in the garrison, and the, the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it became a great trembling. Then Saul's watchman in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went here and there. And Saul said to the people who were with him, Number now, and see who has gone from us. When they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor-bearer were not there. Then Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here, for the ark of God was at that time with the sons of Israel. And it happened that while Saul talked to the priests, the commotion in the camp of the Philistines continued and increased. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and the people uh, who were with him rallied and came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was great confusion, very great confusion. Now, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines previously, who went up with them all around in the camp, Even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. This comes up later. Now, all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines had fled, and they pursued them closely in the battle. So Yahweh saved Israel that day, and the battle spread beyond Beth-Avon. Now, the men of Israel were hard-pressed on that day. And Saul had put the people under an oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food before evening until I have avenged myself on on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Now, all the people of the land entered the forest, and there was honey on the ground. So the people entered the forest, and behold, there was a flow of honey, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the sworn oath. But Jonathan had not heard when his father put the people under a sworn oath. 
Therefore, he put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, dipped it in the honeycomb, and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes brightened. Then one of the people answered and said, Your, your father strictly put the people under a sworn oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food today. And the people were weary. Then Jonathan said, My, my father has troubled the land. See now how my eyes have brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more if only the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now the slaughter among the Philistines has not been great. Then they struck among the Philistines that day from Michmash to Aijalon, and the people were very weary. So the people rushed greedily upon the spoil, and they took sheep and oxen and calves and slaughtered them on the ground. And the people ate them with the blood, which, remember, they're not supposed to do as Jews. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are sinning against Yahweh by eating with the blood. And he said, You have acted treacherously. Roll a great stone to me today. And Saul said, Scatter yourselves among the people and say to them, Each of you bring me his ox or his sheep and slaughter it here and eat. And do not sin against Yahweh by eating with the blood. So all that people that night brought each one his ox with him and slaughtered it there. And Saul brought an altar, rather built an altar to Yahweh. It was the first altar that he built to Yahweh. Then Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and take spoil among them until the morning light, and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatever seems good in your eyes. So the priest said, Let us draw near to God here. So Saul asked of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him on that day. And Saul said, Draw near here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see that this sin has happened today. For as Yahweh lives, who saves Israel, though it is in my rather, though it is in Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. But not one of all the people answered him. Then he said to all Israel, You shall be on one side, and I and Jonathan, my son, will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, Do what seems good in your eyes. Therefore Saul said to Yahweh, the God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. And Jonathan and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to, the, rather, then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you have done. So Jonathan told him and said, I indeed tasted a little honey with the end of my staff that was in my hand. Here I am, I must die. And Saul said, May God do this to me and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. But the people, now the people are revolting, and they said to Saul, Must Jonathan die, who has brought about this great salvation in Israel? Far from it. As Yahweh lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground. For he has worked with God this day. So the people redeemed Jonathan, and he did not die. Then Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. If you remember, as we're reading through the book of Judges, we came to Jephthah's uh, rash vow, where he ended up slaughtering his daughter. He, she purely could have been redeemed but he chose not to do so. This was something that was against actually the law of God. And he still did it to redeem his vow, which he had made, which was a stupid vow and he shouldn't have made it to begin with. This is just showing more of the leadership issues of Saul. Continuing on here in verse 47. Now Saul had taken over, uh, rather had taken the kingdom over Israel and he fought against his enemies on every side against Moab, the sons of Ammon, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment. And he acted valiantly and struck down the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. Now, the sons of Saul were Jonathan and Ishvi and Malkishua, and, or Malkishua, and the names of his two daughters were these, the name of the firstborn, Merab, and the name of the younger, Michael. And the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaaz, or Ahimahaz. And the name of the commander of his army was Abner, son of Ner, Saul's uncle. And Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. Now, 
the war against the Philistines was severe all the days of Saul. And Saul would see any mighty man or any man of valor and would gather him to his staff. Let's move on now to Romans chapter 12. Now, this is the part where we, um, where, where the book makes a clean shift. And it goes from what we've seen before, the orthodoxy section, the doctrinal section of the text, uh, chapters 1 through 11. And now here in verse 12, through the end of the book in verse 16, we get the um, orthopraxy, the practical application of this text, where it's laid out for us given all of the information beforehand, how we should now live as Christians. So this, therefore, we see in the beginning of this chapter is a very deep therefore. It's given in light of all of the information we've had over the previous 11 chapters. Beginning in verse 1, Therefore I exhort you, my brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Again, what does this mean? Well, it's pretty simple. He's saying that um, we should live our lives in service to God based on this previous information. Again, in verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to each one among you, not to think of what, rather not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound thinking, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. But having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy, an agreement with the faith, or service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, and he who gives with generosity, and he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy, by abhorring what is evil and clinging to what is good, being devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, but being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in affliction, being devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and pursuing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. By being of the same mind toward one another, not being haughty in mind, but associating with the humble. Do not be wise in your own mind, never paying back evil for evil to anyone, and respecting what is good in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, having, or rather, being at peace with all men, never taking revenge, uh, rather, never taking revenge, beloved. Instead, leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. But, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, that burning coal thing, we've talked about it before, but reading the note. Um, we'll read it from the Reformation Study Bible. <clears throat> Doing good to an enemy may lead to his conscience being pricked, and thus to his conversion. Or, it could at least lead to such a sense of shame that evil behavior is modified. Let's move on now to Jeremiah 51. Let's 
thus says Yahweh, Behold, I am going to arouse against Babylon and against the inhabitants of Leb Kemai, the spirit of a destroyer. I will send strangers to Babylon that they may winnow her and may empty her land to destruction. For on every side they will be against her in the day of her calamity. Let not him who bends his bow bend it, nor let him who, uh, rather, nor let him rise up in his scale armor. So do not spare her young men, devote all her army to destruction, that they will fall down slain in the land of the Chaldeans and pierced through in the streets. For neither Israel nor Judah has been winnowed uh, by God, by Yahweh, Starting back over verse 5, For neither Israel nor Judah has been winnowed by his God, by Yahweh of hosts, although their land is full of guilt before the Holy One of Israel. Flee from the midst of Babylon, and each of you escape with his life. Do not be silenced in her iniquity, for this is Yahweh's time of vengeance. He is going to render recompense to her. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of Yahweh, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations are going mad. Suddenly, Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail over her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. We applied healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her, and let each of us go to her own country, or sorry, rather, to his own country. For her judgment has touched heaven and lifts up to the very skies. Yahweh has brought about our righteousness. Come, let us recount in Zion the work of Yahweh, our God. Sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. Yahweh has aroused the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his purpose is against Babylon to destroy it. For it is the vengeance of Yahweh, vengeance for his temple. Lift up a standard against the walls of Babylon. Make strong the watch. Raise up watchmen. Establish men in ambush. For Yahweh has both purposed and performed what he spoke concerning the inhabitants of of Babylon. O you who dwell by abundant waters, abundant in treasures, your end has come. The measure of your end, Yahweh of hosts, has sworn by himself. Surely I will fill you with a population like locust, and they will cry out with shouts of victory over you. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom. And by his understanding, he stretched out the heavens. When he gives forth his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he causes the clouds to ascend from the end of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. All mankind is senseless, devoid of knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his graven image. These are, again, gods that people make for themselves. For his molten images are are a lie, and there is no breath in them. Their vanity, a work of mockery, in the time of their punishment, they will perish. The portion of Jacob is not like these, for the maker of all is he, and the tribe of his inheritance, Yahweh of hosts, God of armies, is his name. He says, you are my instrument of shattering my weapon of war, and with you I shatter nations, with you I destroy kingdoms, with you I shatter the horse and his rider, with you I shatter the chariot and its rider, with you I shatter man and woman, with you I shatter old man and youth, with you I shatter choice man and virgin, with you I shatter the shepherd and his flock, with you I shatter the farmer and his pair of oxen, with you I shatter governors and prefects. But I will repay Babylon and the inhabitants of Chaldea for all their evil that they have done in Zion before your eyes, declares Yahweh. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys the whole earth, declares Yahweh. 
and I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags, and I will make you a burnt-out mountain. They will not take from you even a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations, but you will be a perpetual desolation, declares Yahweh. Lift up a standard in the land, blow a trumpet among the nations, settle the nations against her, rather set apart the nations against her, summon against her the, the kingdoms of rather the kingdoms of Ararat, Mini, and Ashkenaz, appoint a marshal against her. Bring up the horses like bristly locusts. Set apart the nations against her, the kings of the Medes, their governors and all their prefects, and every land of their rule. So the land quakes and writhes for the purposes of Yahweh against Babylon. Stand to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitants. The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. They inhabit the strongholds. Their might is dried up. They are becoming like women. Their dwelling places are set on fire. The bars of her gates are broken. One runner runs to meet another, and one messenger to meet another, to give a message to the king of Babylon that his city has been captured from end to end. The fords also have been seized. They have burned the marshes with fire. The men of war are terrified. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. At the time it is stamped firm. Yet in a little while, the time of harvest will come for her. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has devoured me and brought me into confusion. He has set me down like an empty vessel. He has swallowed me like a sea monster. He has filled his stomach with my delicacies. He has rinsed me away. May the violence done to me and to my flesh be upon Babylon. The inhabitant of Zion will say, May me, rather, may my blood be upon the inhabitants of Chaldea. Jerusalem will say. Therefore, thus says Yahweh. Behold, I am going to plead your case and exact full vengeance for you. I will dry up her sea and make her fountain dry. Babylon will become a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, an object of horror and hissing without inhabitants. They will roar together like young lions. They will growl like lion's cubs when they become heated up. I will set before them their feast and make them drunk, that they may exalt and may sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake up, declares Yahweh. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams together with male goats. How Shishak has been captured and the praise of the whole earth been seized. How Babylon has become an object of horror among the nations. The sea has come up over Babylon. She has been uh, covered with its tumultuous waves. Her cities have become an object of horror, a a parched land and and a desert, a land in which no man lives and through which no son of man passes. I will punish Bel in Babylon. Again, these are their gods, Shishak and Bel. And I will make what he has swallowed uh, come out of his mouth and the nations will no longer stream to him. Even the wall of Babylon has fallen down. Come forth from her midst, my people, and each of you escape with his life. From the burning anger of Yahweh, lest now your heart grow faint, and you fear the report that will be heard in the land. For the report will come one year, And after that, a report, rather another report, in another year. And violence will be in the land, with ruler against ruler. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, when I will punish the graven images of Babylon, and her whole land will be put to shame, and all her slain will fall in her midst. Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon. For the destroyers will come to her from the north, declares Yahweh. 
Indeed, Babylon is to fall for the slain of Israel. All, rather, as also for Babylon, the slain of all the earth have fallen. You who have escaped the sword, go. Do not stand around. Remember Yahweh from afar and let Jerusalem come upon your heart. We are ashamed because we have heard of reproach, rather because we have heard reproach. Dishonor has covered our faces, for strangers have entered the holy places of the house of Yahweh. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will punish her graven images, and the mortally wounded will groan throughout her land. Though Babylon should ascend to the heavens, and though she should fortify her lofty stronghold, from me destroyers will come to her, declares Yahweh. The sound of an outcry from Babylon, and the sound of great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans. For Yahweh is going to destroy Babylon, and he will make her loud noise vanish from her. And the rather, and their waves will roar like many waters. The rumbling of their voices sounds forth. For the destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon. And her mighty men will be captured. Their bows are shattered, for Yahweh is a God of recompense. He will fully repay. I will make her princes and her wise men drunk, her governors, her prefects, and her mighty men, that they may sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake up, declares the king, whose name is Yahweh of hosts. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the broad wall of Babylon will be completely raised, and her high gates will be set on fire, so the peoples will toil for nothing, and the nations will become weary only of rather only for fire. The message which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah the son of Neriah, the, the grandson of Messiah, uh, when he went with Zedekiah the king uh, of Judah to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. Now, Sariah was quartermaster. So, Jeremiah wrote in a single scroll all the calamity which would come upon Babylon, that is, all these words which have been written concerning Babylon. Then Jeremiah said to Sariah, As soon as you come to Babylon, then see that you read all these words aloud. Then you will say, You, O Yahweh, have promised concerning this place to cut it off, so that there will be nothing inhabiting it, whether man or beast, but it will be a perpetual desolation. And as soon as you finish reading this scroll, you will tie a stone to it and throw it into the middle of the Euphrates, and then you will say, Just so shall Babylon sink down and not rise again because of the calamity that I am going to bring upon her and they will become utterly weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Let's conclude today in Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Yahweh, for you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies be glad over me. O Yahweh, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. O Yahweh, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have kept me alive that I would not go down to the pit. Sing praise to Yahweh, you, his holy ones, and give thanks for the, remem re starting over, for the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Now, as for me, I said in my prosperity, I will never be shaken. O oh, Yahweh, by your favor, you have made my mountain to stand strong. You hid your face, and, and I, I was dismayed. To you, O oh, Yahweh, I called, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood if I, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? 
Hear, O Yahweh, and be gracious to me. O Yahweh, be my helper. For you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Yahweh, my God, I give thanks to you forever. That's it. That's all of the text for today and also all of the notes. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.